Christine and Leia Papin were two sisters born in Le Mans seven years apart into a dysfunctional family. They grew up witnessing violence and molestation from their father. He raped their elder sister, Amelia Papin, once, after which she fled home and became a nun. Following the divorce, their mother also abandoned them. When the marriage ended, Christine and Leia became the live-in maids in Rene Lancelin's mansion in 1926. Rene was a retired lawyer who lived with his wife Leonie and their 27-year-old daughter Genevieve. Christine and Leia kept to themselves and were always together. They were quiet, speaking very little, and even when they were given breaks, stayed in their bedroom. On February 2, 1933, Leonie and Genevieve Lancelin went shopping. They were supposed to meet Rene Lancelin for dinner that evening at the home of Leonie's brother. The two women returned home to find that the house had lost power. Madame Lancelin was irate when she saw that the power was out. Christine tried to explain what had happened but the fight escalated and she hit Madame Lancelin over the head. Genevieve came to her mother's rescue and began to fight with Christine, at which point Leia joined in the fight. Lancelin returned home and found the bodies of his wife and daughter on the ground surrounded by blood. Christine and Leia admitted to killing the Lancelin women and immediately they were taken to prison. The trial began in September 1933 and Leia was sentenced to 10 years of hard labor because they believed she had been so heavily influenced by her sister. Christine, on the other hand, was given the death penalty. Her sentence was later commuted to life in prison. Christine immediately showed signs of mental decline in prison. She was depressed and stopped eating. She was moved to a psychiatric institution and passed away in 1937. Leia was released from prison in 1941 after serving eight years and lived with her mother. In February 1949, police raided a warehouse in Leopold Road, West Sussex, owned by John George Hay. Inside they found several drums and containers of concentrated sulfuric acid. Outside, they found melted body fat, part of a human foot, part of a human gallstone, and dentures. It was clear what had happened. Hay had murdered someone and dissolved their body in acid to hide his crime. John George Hay didn't start out as a murderer. He was born in Yorkshire to a wealthy, conservative family. At the age of 25, he was arrested and jailed for fraud a few months after his marriage. After his imprisonment, his new bride left him and his conservative relatives decided they didn't want to have anything to do with him. After just two years in prison, John Hay was released from prison and moved to London, where he became a driver. Yet, despite serving time for fraud, he continued to swindle money from unsuspecting benefactors. In 1939 he was arrested and re-incarcerated, this time sentenced to four years for fraud. While in prison, he realized that his greatest downfall was leaving his fraud victims alive to report crimes. In his spare time, he devised his own method of dissolving bodies in various forms of acid by exercising on mice. Eventually, he found that it took 30 minutes for a small vole to dissolve, and he was able to calculate how much acid and how long it would take for an adult male. Four years later, released from prison, John George Hay took a job at an engineering firm in the accounting department. Soon after, he ran into an old friend named William McSwan, for whom he had worked as a driver. McSwan told him about his new venture as a landowner, collecting rent from tenants who stayed on his parents' multiple properties. Although he had a well-paying job at the engineering company, he became jealous of McSwan's lavish lifestyle. A few months after meeting him, he lured McSwan to an abandoned basement and hit him in the head. Using his new method of disposal, he placed McSwan's body in a 40-gallon drum and filled it with concentrated sulfuric acid. Two days later, McSwan was down to about a hundred pounds of mud, which Hay dumped down a manhole. After the five murders, John Hay rented a larger warehouse on Leopold Road with more space for his drums and sour concoctions. Here he would kill and dissolve his last victim. Olive Duran Deacon was a wealthy widow who lived with Hay at the Onslow Court Hotel. Olive considered herself an inventor and when she found out that Hay worked at an engineering firm, she asked if she could tell him about an idea for artificial nails. He took the opportunity to lure her into his warehouse and murder her there. After the discovery of Olive Duran Deacon's body, he was arrested and charged with murder. Now known in popular media as the acid bath killer, he pleaded insane, claiming that drinking the blood of his victims had driven him insane, 
although there was no evidence that he had, in fact, consumed human blood. The jury delivered a guilty verdict on Hay and sentenced him to death. On August 10, 1949, John George Hay was executed for his crimes. Robert Berdella was an entrepreneur who collected unusual artifacts. But between 1984 and 1988, Berdella took the lives of six young men and subjected them to long periods of torture beforehand. Berdella's secret life as a serial killer was finally revealed when one of his victims escaped from his home wearing only a dog collar around his neck. The people of Kansas City were shocked to learn of the brutal crimes Berdella had committed for years in their community, leading him to be called the Kansas City Butcher for his inhuman acts. More than a decade before he committed his first murder, Robert Berdella was selling illegal drugs while attending the Kansas City Art Institute. Berdella reportedly began using drugs and alcohol in college, eventually selling marijuana, amphetamines, and LSD, among other things. Berdella was arrested twice during his second year of college for drug-related offenses and was sentenced to five years with a suspended sentence for his crimes. Robert Berdella's first known victim was 19-year-old Jerry Howell. On July 4, 1984, Berdella, 35, took the teenager in his car and claimed to have taken Howell to a dance, but the 19-year-old was never seen alive again. Berdella allegedly used drugs, such as Valium mixed with alcohol, to relax his victims. He would then inject them with a sedative to knock them out. Usually, he would often invite someone to his home by offering them a meal, drugs or lodging, before serving food or drink to unsuspecting men with the powerful sedatives. Once the men were unconscious and unable to defend themselves, Berdella would take his victims to the basement or a guest bedroom, where he would begin torturing them. Berdella tied his victims' wrists with a rope, also using dog leashes and collars to restrain them. In addition to sexually abusing his victims, Berdella subjected them to painful electric shocks which he administered using a 7700 transformer. He also applied corrosive chemicals, such as bleach, to their eyes, causing excruciating pain and temporary blindness. To stop his prisoners from screaming, Berdella put gags in their mouths. He also injected a drain cleaner into their vocal cords so they couldn't cry. Once the men were dead, Berdella dismembered their bodies and threw them with his trash. After Jerry Howell went missing, his father, Gerald Howell, reported his fears to the police, claiming that Berdella was the last person he saw with the teenager before he went missing. As a result, Berdella was placed under police surveillance, but authorities were unable to find any evidence to accuse him of a crime or stop him from killing again. After killing six young men, Robert Berdella was finally captured because of his latest victim, 22-year-old Chris Bryson. On April 4, 1988, after torturing Bryson for five days, Berdella left Bryson tied up in an upstairs bedroom while he went to work for the day. Bryson was able to get his hands on a pack of matches, which he used to burn the ropes Berdella had tied around his wrists. Wearing only a dog collar, Bryson jumped out of a second-story window and ran to a neighbor for help. When Berdella returned, the police were waiting to arrest him. On July 22, 1988, Robert Berdella was indicted by a grand jury for the murder of Larry Pearson. On August 3, Berdella pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in Pearson's murder to avoid the death penalty. In December 1988, Berdella later pleaded guilty to the first-degree murder of his second victim, Robert Sheldon, and to the second-degree murder of his remaining four victims. Jerry Howell, Mark Wallace, James Ferris and Todd Stoops. Berdella was sentenced to life in prison on December 9, 1988, but died of a heart attack in prison on October 8, 1992. He was 43 at the time and had served less than four years of life in prison. Issei Sagawa was born on April 26, 1949, and for a long time, he had cannibalistic tendencies and an attraction for the consumption of human flesh. Although Sagawa once attempted to see a psychiatrist about his urges when he was 15, he found it unnecessary and continued to retreat into his secluded psyche. Then, in 1981, after 32 years of suppressing his desires, he finally acted on them. Issei Sagawa had moved to Paris to study literature at Sorbonne, a public research university. Once there, he says, his cannibalistic impulses took over. Eventually, he found the perfect victim. 
Rene Hartbert was a Dutch student who studied with Sagawa at the Sorbonne. As time passed, Sagawa became friends with her and occasionally invited her to dinner at his house. At some point he earned her trust. He tried to kill her once, but failed before later murdering her. Immediately after killing her, he raped her corpse and began to cut it open and ate her. Two days after Hartevelt's death, Sagawa got rid of what was left of her body. He had eaten or frozen most of her pelvic area, so he put her legs, torso and head in two suitcases and called a taxi. The taxi dropped him off at the Bois de Boulogne Park, which contains a secluded lake. He intended to leave the bags there, but several people noticed that the bags were dripping with blood and alerted the French police. When the police found Sagawa and questioned him, his response was a simple confession, I killed her to eat her meat, he said. Issei Sagawa waited two years for his trial in a French prison. When it was finally time to try him, French judge Jean-Louis Bruguiere declared him legally insane and unfit to be tried, dropped the charges and ordered him to be held indefinitely in a psychiatric institution. They then deported him back to Japan, where he would spend the rest of his days in a Japanese psychiatric hospital. But he didn't. Today Issei Sagawa walks the streets of Tokyo where he lives, free to do what he wants. In the meantime, however, Sagawa has refrained from cannibalism. But that doesn't stop him from taking advantage of his crime. He wrote restaurant reviews for the Japanese magazine Spa and was successful in a conference circuit where he talked about his impulses about him and his crime. Now 72, he lives with his brother in Tokyo and continues to receive media attention. Dennis Rader was a loving husband and devoted father. All in all, he seemed a reliable and responsible man to everyone who knew him. But he led a double life. Raider's wife Paula Dietz had no idea that he secretly led another life as the Park City, Kansas serial killer, better known as the BTK which stands for, Bind, Torture, Kill. He tortured and killed 10 people. Murdered in and around Wichita, Kansas between 1974 and 1991. Dennis Lynn Rader was born on March 9, 1945, the oldest of four in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Even as a teenager, Rader had a violent streak in him. He hanged and tortured stray animals. He cut out photos of women from magazines that he found arousing and drew ropes on them but Rader kept an ordinary appearance and attended college for a while before dropping out and enlisting in the U.S. Air Force. When he got home from duty, he started working as an electrician in Wichita. Rader was fired from his job as an electrician in 1973 and soon after he killed his first victims on January 15, 1974. While his wife Paula slept, Dennis Rader broke into the Otero family home and killed everyone. The children, 11-year-old Josie, and 9-year-old Joseph were forced to watch him strangling their parents to death. The little girl was dragged to the basement, where Rader stripped off her underwear and hung her from a sewer pipe. He watched the girl choke to death and took pictures of the body and took the little girl's underwear as a memento of his first massacre. Then Dennis Rader went home to his wife. He had to get ready to go to church, after all he was the head of the church. Rader took his next two victims just a few months later. Rader followed and waited at the home of a young student named Catherine Bright before stabbing and strangling her. He then shot his brother Kevin twice, although he survived. Kevin later described Rader as having, psychotic, eyes. After describing how he killed the Oteros in a letter he hid in a tech book at the Wichita Public Library, Rader called the local Wichita Eagle newspaper and told them where to find his confession. He added that he intended to kill again and was called BTK, which was an acronym for his favorite method, bind, torture, and kill. Dennis Rader reportedly took some time off after his killing spree. This only lasted a few years and the BTK killer struck again in 1977. He raped and strangled his seventh victim Shirley Vian to death while his six-year-old son looked through a keyhole. 53-year-old Marine Hedge became the eighth victim, he tied her up and strangled her to death. In 1986, he killed his ninth victim, 28-year-old Vicky Wagerly, while her two-year-old daughter watched from a playpen. Her murder would remain unsolved until he unwittingly put himself on trial. In 1991, he committed his tenth and final crime. Rader used a cinder block to break through the sliding glass door of a 62-year-old grandmother, Dolores Davis, who lived just a few miles from his own family. He dumped her body at a bridge. 
He confessed to all ten murders and seemed to take a twisted pleasure in describing all the brutal details of how the women had died in court. The BTK killer was sentenced to 175 years in prison without the possibility of parole. He escaped the death penalty only because Kansas hadn't instituted the death penalty during his 17-year frenzy. He was 60 when he was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences.